Welcome to another edition of Top Lines and Tales. As always, we'd like to thank our kind sponsors, Harbro, for their extensive collaboration with us here on the Top Lines and Tales podcast. Over the last few months, we've been looking at native breeds of livestock in the UK, and this week we move for the first time from cattle to sheep. Known originally as Southdown Norfolks and later just Black Faces, the Suffolk sheep is a cross between a Norfolk horn and a Southdown ewe. And both these breeds have been in existence for centuries, but it was a few breeders around Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk who put these two together in the 18th century. I have on the show this week Mike Weaver from the Perrin Pit Flock in Gloucestershire and uh, Mike's chairman of the Suffolk Council at the moment. Mike, uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you for having me on. And uh, one can only assume that the Southdown must have been the more dominant animal of that pairing as uh, the offspring came out pretty much without horns, didn't they? Would that, would that be the case? Yeah, I think so pretty well. You know, and that's the, the terminal sire bit of it as well. Um, although you still do get a few outcrosses where you get these stubs of horns come into some of the rams. Still comes back through from all these years later. Yeah. And in 1774, the agriculturalist uh, Arthur Young recognised the Suffolk breed, and uh, he mentions its quality mutton in one of his published papers that uh, that theoretically makes uh, the breed coming up to its 250th birthday, if we, if we take it back uh, that far. But it wasn't until 1859 that classes were introduced for Suffolk sheep at the Suffolk show, and... Uh, I guess some improvement must have been made uh, during those 80-odd years from when Arthur Young first saw them, uh, uh, Mike. We're in our 135th official year now with the Suffolks. Um, and, yeah, in that time, I would say the development has probably been on, on the growth rate the Suffolks got. We're still pretty well up there with against any breed now with what we can uh, put on in growth rates. And, of course, um, the Suffolks actually did a test with... Ulster University a couple of years ago and we actually came out top in the taste tests as well so uh, yeah so it's just a nice little one to get in anyway <laughs> indeed indeed and I know they do eat well but we're just going back to those days because so that Arthur Young saw these sheep and then these guys set about improving them and obviously they developed the type that they wanted and we'll talk about that in a minute that area in, in the east there is more suited to arable isn't it and the sheep would have been confined to the the poorer heath pastures and taking advantage of the Norfolk horn, I guess. So the Norfolk probably put the hardiness in, in the sheep that, that, that the South Down didn't have. Yeah, certainly. But I say even to the start of well, previous century, I'm talking about yeah, the 1900s, mm-hmm. the Suffolk was used as, um, as part of a rotation over in East Anglia um, to put some nutrients back in the soil, sure. uh, you know, part of a big arable rotation. And you had flocks of sort of three, four, five hundred ewes being folded across acres of ground over there. Without being rude to the breed, they are a breed that uh, generally are or more used to and more thrive better on, on the good ground rather than the less. Oh, yeah, def- definitely. Yeah. Uh, uh, over time, the Suffolk sheep grew in popularity as the Norfolk horn uh, declined almost into extinction. And uh, in 1885, the Suffolk sheep breeders petitioned to get classes at the Royal Show, which was to be held in Norfolk that year. However, and here's a familiar story, a number of sheep breeders were getting concerned that the Suffolk breed was becoming too coarse and too heavy and it was agreed that a study be made to define a type so that's that's interesting history almost repeating itself it's uh, coming uh, around again isn't it a hundred years later and and two years later from then in 1887 the flock book was formed with a total of 46 registered flocks uh, the earliest being that of E.P. Frost of West Ratting which was established in 1810 so that's the oldest flock uh, according to our records and and um, from that flock book, uh, those 46 flocks, 32 of them were registered in the county of Suffolk. P- President was the Marquis of Bristol, who owned an, a flock established in 1872, and he remained president until 1901. And his presidency, of course, is still marked to this day by the Bristol Gold Cup, which is awarded to the, the winning flock in the Society's flock book competition uh, every year, and a bloody hard fought competition it is too, Mike. Yes, certainly is. I say not every flock obviously competes in it, but those who wish to, um, yeah, they have a good tussle over who's going to be the winner. 
Good, and we're, we're thankful to the Marquis of Bristol uh, for that. And mm. a definition of the breed was written in 1892, describing them as black faces and hornless, with clean black legs closely resembling the South Down in character and wool, only 30% bigger. So already they've actually outgrown the, 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 the South Down. So one can assume that additional size over the South Down must have come from that Norfolk horn. And we've got a, a lovely description here. I'm not sure who wrote it, but uh, it says, it describes them as handsome and hardy, happily hornless, prolific in twins, rarely born less, face and forelegs as black as the devil, the breast, back and loins all wide and level, well covered in meat of muscle, no lack, legs of mutton, well filled, tail level with back. And Burns couldn't have written that any better, couldn't he? Isn't that a lovely description of a subject? No, it is a good description, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's lovely. So the first society sale was held in Ipswich in 1895. And it's, I mean, it's noted from this and a few subsequent sales that many of the sheep found homes in the north, mostly in the borders of Scotland, but some went as far north as Aberdeen. And a consignment of 11 ram lambs from Joseph Smith of Walton averaged £13. Pounds. Now, that, that would be a fair trade at the turn of the century. I've been looking at black recently and they were averaging two pounds and they were happy with that so 13 oh, right. pound okay. 13 pound would be a good trade and in 1898 the Suffolk had classes at the Royal Highland Show held in Kelso under the influence of William Ford of Fenton Barnes in uh, Dream in East Lothian I know that farm because I used to live nearby it and uh, one of the best farms in East Scotland today full of tatties these days but I suppose that just again yeah, shows yeah. that some of these sheep were, were going on to onto good ground weren't they good ground yeah mm-hmm. And that would be probably the time, Mike, when when the the breed started to spread north, I guess. A lot of breeds were doing the same, particularly the beef cattle. These guys were starting to pick out what they wanted for the... the, Oh, yeah. Well, you can see even then, as now, you've got some flipping good livestock farmers up in that part of the country. So they'd be looking for, for good quality stock, wouldn't they? They would, as I said, some looking for good quality stock to go on good quality land back then, which things may be mm. slightly changed now because the good quality land, as you know where you are, will be, uh, be ri- being ripped up and planted with potatoes and soft fruit and various other things. But hey, that's evolution, I guess. Um, m- moving on the statistics here, the national registered flocks grew from 191 in 1907, 354 in 1923, 484 in 1953. So we're growing and then suddenly over 2000 in 1983. So, culminating in 2,383 in 1985. So that's sort of total domination, really, that the 80s, they just suddenly, uh, they suddenly came to the fore, didn't they? And everybody, everybody had some pure Suffolk. Oh, it was, yeah. And that was a good time for the breed as well, obviously, with that many members in it. And you're saying that was before your Continentals started coming in. Familiar. Um, as you said, we had, we had total dominance back then. Familiar story with the cattle and the sheep in, in a lot of yep. these podcasts. We've mm-hmm. heard that the continentals come in and topple some of these uh, breeds that maybe are sitting on their laurels, and I won't go down that route just yet. But going back during the First World War, more land in the east would be put under the plough, of course, when the wars came on, and the Suffolk sheep numbers declined, particularly in that area. The first society secretary was Ernest Prentice mm-hmm. in 1887, he reported that a number of ewes and lambs had been exported to Europe, Russia, South and North America, and also the colonies. So, uh, in fact, in 1893, the American Suffolk Flock Registry was incorporated under the presidency of Henry C. Wallace of Iowa. So these sheep are now starting to get exported well over 100 years ago. Um, Flocks had been established in Ireland in 1891 by Henry Strevens of Roscommon and R.L. Moore of Londonderry in the north of Ireland. And the first flock in Wales was owned by W.R. Shirley of Leckwith near Cardiff. Um, And the local flock competition started around Suffolk, but then in 1912, as we mentioned, it was extended to the whole of Great Britain and Ireland. A council was made up of a number of breeders from around the Suffolk area, but also included a J.P. Ross Taylor from Duns in Scotland, who would later be famous for breeding the Aberdeen Angus Bull Ever of Wandle, who sold for 29000 And again, on some good land uh, there, that was back in 1961. W.O. Steel of Henley and Arden. And then again, uh, good ground around there, Mike, that's your, more your part of the world. And he was closely involved, wasn't he, the Steels, and very influential breeder yep. of long- longevity, weren't they? Yeah, um, I'd have to check whether they might even still be going, I think. Yep. 
wouldn't surprise me. I certainly remember them exhibiting at the Royal uh, uh, back in the day, anyway. Uh, the first official yearbook was published in 1931, and as well as containing facts and figures from the shows and sales, there were adverts from some flocks, such as a Brantham from J.R. Keeble and Sons, um, the Curtain flock of Stuart Paul and Sons, who later went on, of course, to be uh, um, grain merchants uh, uh, along with uh, BOCM. Southburn was Sir Prince Prince Smith Bart, who uh, uh, is, is a great name we'll come on to. Gerardstown, uh, um, Jay McCulloch would be in, in Ireland, and Ash Bocking from Jay Long, of course, would be uh, Jonathan's grandfather, I guess. And uh, Ernest yep. Prentice yep. was replaced by Miss Prentice in 1920, who I would guess was probably his daughter. And um, H. A. Byford taking over the role in 1953. So that's sort of a potted history we get up to the to the to the wartime, if you like. Um, the, the Suffolk Sheep also played a role at the Royal Smithfield Show from as early as 1895, and it was quite common that the Suffolks would win at least a third of the prizes on offer around the turn of the century. His Majesty King George the Sixth became patron in 1937 until his death. And, um, the, the Suffolks would have a good good time at Smithfield, though, wouldn't they? They would they would have ruled the roost there, Mike, for for a long time. You'll have been in amongst that one. Oh yeah, definitely. And I'd say even in the more recently in the eighties and even up to nineteen ninety, you had the likes of Jack Bulmer winning the Supreme Championship there with Pure Suffolks. So yeah, that was good going. Certainly, they had a long, long run, as you said, until these uh, pesky continentals came in and showed the mm. head. Um, <laughs> by by the thirties, a few other breeders included Frank Sainsbury's from the supermarket family, of course, um, Commander Jay Duncan, uh, and there were mentions of a few top shepherds of the time, including Alfred and Charles uh, Lambard. Do you know those, Mike? I can just barely remember them, yeah. but you had the likes of Harry Boast at Wasps, um, being one. Arthur Vaughan was another. Um, some good sheep men you know really good shepherds yeah after the second world war to add to the list of breeders we have jh Poole from ireland hugh fraser from linton burnfoot jack and richard bomber you just mentioned at malton uh roger weaver your, your father obviously uh mike from perrin pent and uh, and michael walton up there in, in northumberland so these last trio of course would go on to be dominant players over the next uh, couple of decades uh, and more especially your own flock yeah that's it i'm not gonna say we were the dominance or anything but, you know, you had back then in the sort of 70s, 80s, uh, into the 90s, you had a good number of flocks throughout the whole of the country. Um, and you could almost go into any any pen in the main sales and buy any one of them and you'd go on and do you well. OK, and as the flock competition that we mentioned uh, extended, the Bristol Cup was won by uh, Haggerston, um, J. Hislop in 1958. Uh, Chevlock, uh, W. E. Lloyd in 64, 65 and 73. Perry and Pitt, yourselves, uh, a Weaver and Son in 69, 70, 84 and 86. Uh, a good run there. And uh, Barons from J&J &J Barron, I remember they were in 72, 74, 75, 79 and 80. So they probably won uh, in those eras, maybe done the most. But uh, we'll mention a few more. Well, winners of those cups in, in a moment, uh, Mike. But let's just take a, take a closer look at some of those early flocks that we mentioned. The Southburn flock there, Prince Prince Smith. That's a bit of a mouthful. What do we know about uh, What do you know about him? I would say Dad would be probably been the better one to ask than me, that because that was a bit before my time. But yeah, he was fairly dominant at the time, along with sort of Lawshaw, which was Wasps. You know, there's two or three flocks over in the eastern counties, and they still sort of ruled the roost at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And um, and barons, of course, they would carry on through in, into your era. and, and uh... Yeah, that, I say that was it until his dispersal. It was one of those flocks where you could go and buy, you know, any any sheep out of the pen. We mentioned Curtin there that was uh, Paul's and, and uh, Moulton. Um, uh, Jack and Richard Bormer again dispersed. I think, uh, if I remember right, that um, Scotty Brown bought some, quite a few of the sheep from Jack Bormer's uh, dispersal. That uh, Yeah, wouldn't surprise well. me. Yeah, so. yeah. Mike Walton, of course, was always a, a man that was associated with Mike Walton and the family, should I say, still are, of great livestock and, uh, mm, and some yep. maybe harder ground where they are there, but uh, always brought out some good up stuff. At, up at Rosedon there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. and, Mick and yourself at Perrin Pit there, we were talking earlier on, you said you still run 70-odd uh, ewes. You, you've got a flock going back a, a long way now. Do you still have some of those original lines there, uh, Mike? Yeah, we're this is our 70th year this time. Um, yeah, so I'm still running, I don't know, 70 pure. I suppose, at the moment, yeah. 
Okay, and by the 80s, uh, tups like Greyhill Grundy from Jimmy Wallace would uh, would start putting a backbone in some of those early high flyers as we knew them, and uh, tups that maybe bred the females before the big money came along. Can you name a few you know, tups from those early 80s uh, days, Mike? I can say the flocks there, you've got Bridgeton, Greyhill, Kirkton, Ford of Forey, Glen Isla. Uh, Lord of Dale Sportsman would have been a good ram back in the early 80s and um, certainly on the female side, you'd be doing well. Some of those sheep at that time were, of course, the backbone of the breed. And uh, my pal uh, Mark Lewis remembers the day that uh, yep. he outbid the Aberdeen boys for a Cairness uh, top when he worked at Wappenbury Estates, of course, which was owned by uh, Sir William Lyons of uh, Jaguar Cars. And uh, I think they broke the record that day. Um, buying a tup for 17,000, the breed record, but uh, sadly the tup didn't breed. So thankfully it was insured, so there we go, we move on. Um, and, and Mark mentioned uh, um, a tup called R. Ben Arkell. R. Ben Arkell, yeah, yeah, that would have been the same time as uh, when Lord Air Sportsman, um, yeah, in those early 80s. Another one of those Rams that did really well, mm. yeah. And as you mentioned just now, you, you've got a few copies of the old uh, journals there. And, of course, a lot of those photographs would be photographed by Dougie Lowe. And uh, Dougie probably needs to mention in this episode, he would have been the specialist, wouldn't he, there? He'd, a lot of those sheep oh, he'd, he'd, he'd have put Yeah, up. back then, yeah. I say you definitely had Dougie come out to take your photos. Mm. I can say we had him come to the farm a number of times to take individual pictures of when we had in lamu sales dougie if you're yeah. listening in we wish you well um soon uh, aberdeenshire there would become the home of the breed wouldn't it uh, for a good few decades i guess and let's talk about some of those boys up there that would be going more the late 80s and the first name we really should talk about is the mayors of at muresque of course and, and and that you've been there i'm sure mike that's some good dairy land isn't there about tariff there and uh, a very able family i know but again we're looking at sheep on on good ground aren't they and these guys are possibly be the, yeah. possibly be the start of the type change is that fair to say that yeah. to more bone and head? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I see that was when when they were at their peak. That was when things just started to change a bit more. Yeah, but it's, it's a really good farm and uh, the right sort of ground for the sheep. Mm-hmm. And, and it is good ground around there. And we move a little bit further north. And, of course, we've got Jimmy Douglas at uh, north up by Fraserborough there. And uh, these northern sheep would just seem to be bigger and superior, definitely for a while anyway. And... Uh, Along with a few others, uh, Jimmy Wilson, um, of course, and you mentioned uh, Sandy Lee at Fortafori and, and you know, another able breeder, and then, of course, Gordon and Robbie Wilson, up, Harry Emsley Sr., of course. Uh, these guys would come down and bring these sheep out. They would just seem bigger somehow, didn't they? Well, that's it. And you say you've just got to look at, I'm saying, in today's market, from the same area, you've got Burness. Mm-hmm. You know, Stuart's of Burness uh, doing exactly the same thing now. So, uh, yeah, no, that's it. They were bigger. <laughs> I always thought it was the wool that made them look bigger, but they, you know, they were a big sheep anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm. And uh, yes, they would be well fed as well. We don't, uh, we don't deny that. And we should, of course, mention Harbro, who kindly sponsor this podcast, uh, using their expertise to develop some uh, tremendous uh, sheep rations for those guys, working closely alongside them as well. And uh, you know, it kind of put Harbro on the map as well as it did put the, the those Aberdeen sheep breeders on the map. Um, I remember Bruce Mayer, a math teacher, of course, Bruce was, uh, um, mm-hmm. is, uh, was anyway, um, explaining how the whole line breeding program worked and stuff that he'd learned, I think, from earlier breeders, plus his mathematical knowledge. And uh, it, it was quite fascinating, and it stayed with me anyway. And now after, or a year's research, should I say, into some of these old breeders and breeds, um, I realized that a lot of this stuff was proven already, this sort of line breeding method that they had. And it, I suppose it's just that ET allowed them to extend it further and faster. But uh, these guys learned how to breed them in, and that's where a lot of the, a lot of the, the clever men uh, got, got in front, wasn't it? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I can say it's one. It's one of those things. When it works, it's uh, line breeding. When it doesn't, it's inbreeding. But uh, yeah, I can say even now, you know, Jimmy Douglas at Cairness. You'll, if you look back through the pedigrees, there'll be Cairness right the way through. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it does show it does work in a lot of circumstances, not to say every time, obviously. Certainly, he had a, a, a method, I remember him so describing, we had three main views and, and three main female lines and literally buying, buying a tuck back into that female line from somewhere else mm. and then flushing them in and, and on they went and pr- pretty much almost guaranteed their breed. And, and I say that's gone back through through the generations and a lot of other breeds as well. But there were a few others out with Aberdeenshire, such as uh, John Sinner to Stockton, we've got to talk about, of course, and he'd have some of those same female lines, I guess, and... and uh, He'd start selling tups back into that that click, if that's the right word. Uh, I mean, those guys up there did have a sort of cartel, and they kept the circle tight. But uh, Sinnott was one of the boys that was sort of back into there, and some man, uh, John Sinnott, Mike. Oh, definitely. 
I say well, he was a big man in the in the Clun Forest at the time. Then he went to Sydney Price at Crestage and to ourselves to buy his foundation stock. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we we stayed close to John. And uh, yeah, we bought a number of rams together um, with him. So yeah, we've had close connections with John. I say he's probably the the most famous one we bought together would have been the Muresk Aston Martin, which was the record price at Kelso in. Mm, 91 92 for 20,000 pounds. Okay. Mm. But, and him and yeah, your, your, your old man and, and John would spar a little bit. There was always a bit of crack when those two were, when those two were together. That's for, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. his father, of course, would have had, uh, as you said, had clans and, and, and uh, there would be Herefords at Stockton Court before him, I guess. And again, some good land there running down to the, the river team in, in Worcestershire. And mm. he was a neighbour of mine. I lived, uh, lived down that same way. There uh, was a good farm. Uh, and, and tops such as Stockton Sir John and Stockton Ace and, and uh, started the action really for John, didn't it? And mostly by KNS or Muresk um, sires. And John seemed to know how to breed show sheep, didn't he? Uh, and again, some of those classes would be unbelievably strong and yourselves in the mix as well the the royal show would be and, and the local shows would be absolutely battleground between you guys there to, oh, that's it. yeah for for us it would have been with john it would have been between us at the royal show and the and the three counties mm. um but yeah it was it was all good fun <laughs> yeah it was indeed and we're going to talk about a top called panky more prelude and uh, um you'd be as best places anybody to tell me about uh, about this story of, of Prelude there, of course, bred by uh, John Sheraton Shropshire there. And uh, what can you tell me about uh, about the story of Prelude? Uh, Prelude, well, um, he was actually out of a Bridgeton new, Jimmy Wilson new, um, that John had bought. So uh, so John was very lucky with having been able to buy the, buy the mother of, uh, of Prelude. Um, and I remember at the time, I don't know if it was done tongue in cheek or whatever, but... Uh, when it came to the Shepherd's Prize, um, uh, the Edinburgh sale, uh, Jimmy Wilson was awarded the Shepherd's Prize. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, be asked to go up by John Sherratt. So, <laughs> but yeah, he was one of those, you know, really influential um, Rams back then. Yeah. At the time, there were a few rumours around his pedigree, but uh, rumours is all they were as far as uh, as I'm concerned on this podcast. Um, but Prelude was just an outstanding sheep, wasn't he? And, and he went on and bred, that's the thing. You know, he did. He bred for, for a lot of people. I think that would be uh, 1992, and he went on to sell for 20,000, I think, in, uh, in Ingleston, Edinburgh. I certainly mm. remember seeing him. He was an outstanding uh, lamb. And I remember John Sinnott judging the Stafford County show, I think it was, and uh, putting him last in the class there for, for pretty much most of the time he was out there. And John Sherratt's face was an absolute picture. And then last minute he moved Then up, put him up, up at the first. end. Well, <laughs> well that's, 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 that's John for you. I'm surprised he didn't. He probably lined them up last to first. And yeah. then you think you're at the, one, the wrong end of the line. And you end up being at the right end of the line. <laughs> Yeah. As I said, you guys had some fun doing that. And, and sticking with John Sinnott, he was also the first person to clip lambs out for sale. And that was a ballsy move, wasn't it? Shaved them bare pretty much just before the sale. And worthwhile, do you, do you think, is that a trend there, uh, Mike? Well, that, and I say he had him on wood shavings as well. And that was the year of Stockton Almighty that he sold for 75000 mm-hmm. But yeah, so, uh, the, the idea, the idea of shaving them bare, is so you, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's no dressing of it all. It's not all about the dressing, and b, you, what you see is what you get. And I mean, there's a exactly, yeah. It, it, it's a great idea if you've got the right sheep underneath them. But uh, I assure you, oh, definitely, not yeah. everybody could have got away with doing that. I think, uh, and and they didn't. Nobody no, else you, really tried it. Well, that's it. No one tried it. You, you certainly had to have a good shoulder on the on the sheep anyway to be able to do it. I'd like to see some of these texts all shared out that way, but uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Andy, yeah. you'll get thrown off. And and you mentioned Stockton um, uh, Almighty, of course, 75,000 broke a record and sold to Tom Bailey in, in Ireland. He was by a KNS sire, I think. And uh, let's have a chat about Tom Bailey. And Pat Greeny was the was the man there, was the shepherd in there. But Tom was just a larger than life character, wasn't he? A self made millionaire builder and, and, and some. Oh, definitely. You know, Tom, Tom certainly put the, the south of Ireland on the map when it came to Suffolk's back at that time you know if he wanted a sheep whether it be a ram or a, or a ewe at any of the inland ewe sales at the back end he, he would buy it mm-hmm. uh, and that was all there was to it as you said self-made man out of building when this, the old uh, celtic tiger crashed a little bit he lost a bit but he's still there you can see the suffolks went but uh, mm-hmm. he's still got the limbs over there at the moment and mm-hmm. doing well with them mm-hmm. 
certainly a man, as you said, he will, when he wanted to buy something, he would. And we've seen men in more recent times have been quite, uh, quite similar, similar way to that. That when they mm. when they decide they're going to go, the the checkbook comes out and it stays out till it's till the deal's done. And uh, yeah, credit credit to him. And of course, buying into that uh, that cartel, the Abadija cartel as well, wouldn't be an easy thing to get into. And uh, they, I imagine they enjoyed his enjoyed him when he turned up in his helicopter from time to time. Oh yeah, well I can remember. Um... I wouldn't know what year it was, but it was at the Ipswich sale. And back in those days for the dinner, um, the awards dinner the night before, you know, after the judging and the showing and the night before the sale, there would have probably been 150, 180 of us all sat down along long tables, all dressed in suits. And there was this chap I'd never met before opposite me with these huge cigars um, enjoying himself, and that was Tom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was. He was. A, he liked up any 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 party. That's for sure. Moving on the sheep a little bit there, I've got Cairness Court who sold twenty six thousand. I think was probably a record to Stockton, and then uh, Stockton Court for twenty eight thousand back to Cairness. And uh, should I say any more about that, Mike? Well, it still happens now. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, there's there's groups that buy off each other um, just to make sure the money keeps going round. <laughs> So, uh, so you know, and and it probably happened before then as well. It's about keeping the breeding, mm. keeping the breeding families together and buying their own blood back. They say, but as you said, sometimes yeah, it's, it about, is. it's yeah, about yeah. keeping the money yeah. going around as well from year to year. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, and we got another Stockton Tup Stockton Storm of fifty four thousand in nineteen ninety seven. Yep. Again, would be a record breaker, I think. Uh, maybe wouldn't just then. He, he wasn't have. the record breaker then, but he was, you know, he was still a good ram anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. And uh, mm. we, we always like to pick a few influential females on this podcast. Podcast, and one of those would be uh, Muresk UK79. And uh, I remember seeing her written up somewhere, and she bred a top called Muresk Dancing Brave, who I think they kept, and he bred very well for them at Muresk. And then uh, she was the mother of uh, Muresk King of Diamonds at 68,000. And uh, I've an idea he was by Prelude, was he not? Yeah, I think he was actually. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember I bought, Dad and I bought one of the last sons of K79 at a, you know, from Muresk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a really good breeding family she line was. from her. Tremendous breeder, and again with the flushing techniques that came in there, of course she'd be they'd be turning quite a few out from from that family. But uh, and I think mm. just going back to King of Diamonds, I think he sold to KNS if uh, if I remember rightly, and a few other um, Irish breeders, David Duncan at Laurel Bank, of course these guys who would be coming in and chasing, propping, the, underpinning the prices. I suppose that's probably the the right word, even if they weren't sort of taking the top ones. But they were big prices, Mike, weren't they back then? I mean, this is way above anything else we'd seen in in any other breeds really and uh, it, it was uh, I suppose the commercial aspect of the breed was starting to lose favour would I be right I mean the, the sheep were becoming too extreme perhaps and go on. you look at the pictures of sheep in the 60s and 70s compared to the 80s and there's no getting away from the fact that um, you know the head and bone had um, become more extreme mm. um, I'm not going to say they necessarily lost the fleshing as well um, but it wasn't as prominent as it was back in the 60s, 70s. And again, see. we've seen this in, in other breeds. We've it seen it happened, in, it's happened in other breeds, exactly. Yeah. And we've yeah. discussed this on our on our podcast. I mean, the belt buckle era of the cattle, of course, is about chasing the headlines and losing the focus of the home trade and a bull selling for 60,000 and, and his teammate in the same pen, stable in the same pen, made 120 guineas or something. It just shows that they mm. they were chasing the big money and they just hadn't got the, the market for the for their, their other ones. And then it did, the commercial aspect of the breed was, was starting to lose favour. Or maybe they just simply run out of outcrosses. And I, I remember Drew Adam telling me that uh, his father at Newhouse, Bob Adam at Newhouse, uh, said the cows were so tightly bred that uh, eventually it became almost impossible to find an outcross to, to, to make them click to. So uh, a little bit of truth in that as well, Mike, maybe. Oh, definitely. And I think we're finding it now, um, you know, definitely with the increase in ET being used. I'm, you know, I've, I've got nothing against AI, um, ET at the moment, I know when we used to do it, was to have a couple of good lines and to breed some females to retain in the flock. I can say ET nowadays, you look in the main sale catalogs, both the rams in the summer and the inland ewes in the, at the back end, and they're all ETs. Um, so they're not, you know, they're not retaining females for their own use. Um, it's there as a, as a selling tool. And if they want to do that, fine. But I, I just do feel it just does narrow that gene pool a little bit too much. 
Mine's not the position to question. It's probably yours neither, for that matter, to question how these people... Well, that's right. If, if they can make, make money out of doing it, then then that's how it is. Yeah. Certainly in some of the breeds, textile yeah. specifically. I mean, a lot of these, as you said, they're buying... You buy one new for a lot of money and just flush it and sell... Everybody wants to buy the offspring, the females, mm-hmm. which is... It's different times, different times. Anyway, I suppose that probably yeah. probably leads us through the 90s up to the, the millennium sheep and... Uh, Going back to what I said about losing some of the commercial aspect of the breed, a lot of the northern boys turned to the Texel, and uh, quite a few of them unloaded the Suffolk's all in a fairly short space of time, really. I suppose Foot and Mouth took care of a few more as well, but there were a few top flocks uh, all went away fairly quickly, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Texels were the, were the breed, the incoming breed, and uh, and they saw that it was probably a, an easier way of, uh, of making a bit of money out of them. Mm-hmm. But it would be later a new band of breeders with a much more commercial demand that would uh, lead the resurgence wouldn't they and none more than uh, Alistair Galt in Northern Ireland who had a foot in both Texel and, and, and the Suffolk camps and other names like Limestone and Paul Dells at Bridgeview Ian Barber at Solway Bank uh, but they'd be tough times for a while though Mike wouldn't they I mean it would, t- Suffolk's would be would be hard to sell especially the second string. Yeah, it it was like that, as you say. The your first pick out of the big flocks would still make good money, but uh, you say you could go to some of the lesser sales at the, towards the end of the top selling season, and uh, you know they'd be struggling to sell them for two hundred. Yeah, that's just how it was well, back then. And then they'd owe them three hundred before they got them there. So uh, yes, yeah, so they... well, ex- exactly. Yeah, but you know, there's there's a number of people. And so you mentioned Alistair Galt. There's two or three other lads in uh, in Northern Ireland who have come to the the fore now. Well, you mentioned Limestone, so that's uh, Mark Priestley. You've got Willie Tate, Dennis Taylor, mm-hmm. Stephen Suffering, and I'm going to probably get a bit of a cussing for missing anybody else out who's doing well out there at the moment. Mm-hmm. And you see, Paul Dells, he was in and he went out. Now he's come back in again, mm-hmm. doing well. And Ian, Ian and Judith Barber, it's doing well at Solway Bank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and and. I spoke to, to Golty earlier on, and he sort of listed me a few more recent uh, animals that he think, he believes have been a, of influence uh, since the millennium. And, and we look at the females, and again, we were asked right there at the fore with uh, two U's, uh, S46 and then uh, U42, who uh, between them won the Highland in uh, 1998, 1999, and, uh, and 2002. A great family again, uh, Mike. Well, that's it, from a good flock. Mm. And if you've got a good family within a good flock, you know, they're going to do well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We got Bailey's uh, mm-hmm. F60, who won the Highland in 2006, and she won Balmoral the same year. And then a ewe lamb bought from Scott Brown, I mentioned earlier on, uh, uh, which I think Scott, he said, is, goes back to the Bulmer's sheep that he bought, a ewe lamb that he sold to the mares, and uh, she went on and won the Highland twice mm-hmm. uh, for Muresk in uh, 2007 and 2008. Um, uh, great credit to all of them there. Uh, yeah, no, oh, definitely, yeah. And in Ireland, uh, Gary Beacom, uh, you missed, as uh, you called uh, Queen of the Maze, and well-named because she won uh, Balmoral Show uh, uh, three times champion. Uh, Solway Bank, uh, Eva, uh, slightly later on here now, on the Highland Show in 2014, and probably uh, deserves a mention being a great beast. I remember, remember seeing her. Yeah. Okay, and, and some tops then uh, to look at from, again, from the millennium going forward. Uh, Glen Isla, Sydney, 26,000 from Gordon Wilson, was sire of the year in uh, 2001. Do you remember remember him, Mike? Yeah, he went to Tom Bailey. Yeah, bred very well. Yeah. T- tell me about the sire of the year then. I've seen it in the Herefords. How, how, how does one qualify for that? Basically, it's the top four price ram lambs at society sales okay. by the same sire, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Still a great achievement to have, and and uh, oh yeah, yeah. Strath Isla dead lucky, of course, from Gordon's brother Robert, more known to most of us uh, nowadays in in the in the Texas, of course. And Strath Isla dead lucky, who sired Borland Buddha, who in turn was the sire of uh, Glenho Gurkha from Tom Bailey, who was uh, sold for thirty thousand. And Gurkha was another sheep that uh, made a hell of a mark on 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 the breed, didn't he? Well, that's right. I see. We were actually underbidders on Buddha, okay. um, Dad and myself, and Tom Tom had him, and you say. Yeah, the Strath Isla sheep, Dead Lucky, was a was a good breeder, um, and there is a bit of a story to that one actually. Um, Borland Buddha's the the breeder, Robert Fleming. He had appeared in the pre-sale advert or or bit of editorial in the Scottish Farmer, and there was the picture of the of the of his Edinburgh Tup lambs in there, and of course there was this lamb to one side, and all, you know, Dad's 
opinion, Christ, that's a bloody good ram. I'm gonna have to make sure I go and see him, and that was uh, and that was Buddha. And he was uh, and obviously t- 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 Tom thought the same as well. And he was forty five thousand. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a, a good investment, as I said. But you keep going with Tom; it could have been one hundred forty five thousand. You would. Oh, ex- exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Two thousand and four saw the, the twenty four thousand kings high and mighty, uh, um, who sired sons to twenty five thousand and seventeen thousand, and the following year, sons to uh, to thirty two thousand. What do you tell me about him? Yeah, he went. That was yeah. He went across to. Harry Stewart at Castle Wellin in Northern Ireland. Okay. The, yeah, did well there. The, the main yeah. name, of course, well, we haven't mentioned there. Harry Stewart was a very able, very able sheep breeder there. Um, 2006 saw Raider Rossi from uh, Myver Evans make 70,000. Of course, the man again who's made a big inroads in the, in the Texel side as well. And uh, uh, Raider Rossi, uh, he was Sarah the year uh, that uh, that following year. So it's 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 nice to see when these big money sheep do actually come back and breed because they they don't all do that, Mike, do they? No, no, not at all. Some will disappear from from sight and just back into history, yeah, and just be a name. So it's good to see lines do well. Mm-hmm. well then we've got Strathyla Speed again from from Robbie Wilson, uh, careless achievement who had a big influence on uh, on the breed at the end of uh, of that decade. I think, Mike. Yeah, definitely. So Speed put his mark on, uh, right across the breed. Real good fleshy sheep. Um, if you're to, to be ultra critical, he was probably a bit dark, but with the price of wool, no one was giving much worry about that at the time. But certainly, a good flesh and sheep and careless achievement, and bred some really good sheep as well. Bailey's BMW was the champion at the Highland, um, and so had a lot of influential males and, and females at the start of the new decade. And I suppose another sheep that, uh, that definitely yep. put his stamp across the breed. Yeah, definitely. I I was actually the judge. I judged at Highland that year and put him champion. Mm-hmm. No, a really good sheep for um yeah. Merver Evans bought him. Okay. Off of Tom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, moving on, I suppose there's a lot of sheep we could mention. A lot of people we could mention. K N S E N was the sire of the eighty thousand. Uh, Ardley R. Benning, who in turn sired uh, Raider Rolex at twenty five thousand, which is uh, is behind a lot of the influential rams uh, up to this day, I believe. You, you can say, and it's the same for any breed, you get a good influential line in and you can follow it right the way back. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another one of those lines. Yeah. Limestone Legacy, a major player in today's breed, I believe. And, and uh, the son's topping at 30,000, 26,000. And his flock mate, Limestone Aston Martin, winning the champion at Balmoral before selling for 43,000. So there's another good line mm-hmm. there. And his, his son sold for the following year for... 23,000, 21,000, 20,000, uh, another sheep that's uh, making somebody a bit of money. Yeah? Well, that's right. Off the top of my head, I think Aston Martin was by kind of magic. Um, so, uh, yeah, another ram that you can see going right the way back through the lines. Mm-hmm. And a ram that same day, uh, Salopian uh, Scuderia, uh, had also been a big influence uh, recently, selling rams to 40,000 this year. And... Uh, and the twenty six thousand top price in two thousand and seventeen, and we'll we'll move up to date in a second. But so, some of the breeders kept an eye on on the commercial aspect of the breed, and they, such as uh, past podcast guests of, of mine on here, Marky Stewart at at, um, at, um, at Sandy now, and of course Scott Scott and Gavin Brown. And these guys sort of had a reputation at at Kelso, and that was their a good client repeat clientele for tops, and they were looking for a different type of sheep to these bigger boned ones. And it was almost like there was a there was a different type of breed going on altogether there. Back then, it was getting that way a bit. You've got to remember probably that the Suffolk is mainly a terminal sire um, and a meat breed. So uh, that's what we've got to be breeding. And that's what those guys were were pushing hard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, seeing that Malcolm sold up um, earlier this year, you know, sad loss. We'll give Malcolm a, a mention in a second. And also the likes of James Alexander, a young man with, again, with very much an eye on, on the money and eye on the commercial market and uh, slotting in with on-farm sales and, and, and starting to find a, a trade and chose in whichever breed he wanted to go into. He chose to go into Suffolk, I think, over Texas. And, and that probably says a little bit about where the breed is coming back to. And of course, uh, Logie Derno boys, uh, Ingram as well, they've got some pretty good commercial Suffolks coming out of that stable as well. It's it, It's a it, it, it's, a, it's a different type of sheep to maybe the ones that are winning winning the Highland Show. Oh yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, but that's what the breed's about. I can say if people want to breed, um, being on council of the Suffolk Sheep Society for a number of years, and you know, we are a broad church, mm. and we're not trying to point people in any one particular direction. If you can sell sheep in in doing a certain thing, then great, you go on and do it. Um, and it is good to see that James and those at Logie Durno. They've got a bloody good market, and uh, 
and can make it make it pay. Mm-hmm. So good luck to them. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, yeah, you mentioned the the, the, the terminal sir, but of course the Suffolk makes a good U as well, a good cross, and you cross them, you know, the, the, the first cross U, and then putting them back to a, you put them back to to a Leicester. Possibly you do that to think yourself, Mike, didn't it? Would it be fair to say that's a, a different type of sheep again that you'd want to make that that the breeding of those females? Yeah, it is. I say, so, yeah, you want in a good um, slick hair, clean wooled sheep. I I put. I put a Leicester onto my bottom half of my pedigree ewes to produce a, a Suffolk mule type ewe. And that's my commercial flock then, because I retain the health status mm-hmm. um, doing it that way. And uh, yeah, I say these, these Leicester cross Suffolk ewes, they are massive. I originally started doing it to, you know, it was ET recips. Mm-hmm. And I, I only only did it for a couple of years, but I kept it going just to, you know, as I said, just, it's my commercial flock. Sure. And, and, um, and you'd be topping those, what, back to something like a Beltex or, or, or something smaller? Or are you going to uh, go I, with a big... Put them on to, I've got a Charolais I put on okay. them. Mm-hmm. That seems to work well, actually. Okay. Okay. You know, it's still fast growing. And I get, you know, I get most of them away um, by the back end. Good. And again, that shows the diversity of the breed, which is sort of where we came in, really. And moving then up to date, because Solway Bank Rock Solid uh, had already produced many top sheep before this year, but then he signed the, the 200,000 Salopian Solid Gold and another record, which will, he may stand for quite a while, uh, um, uh, Mike. And, and Philip Poole, he's from your neck of the woods down there somewhere. Wasn't that out of a Stockton you, if I remember right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Phil Poole, he's up in Shropshire. Mm. Um, so a couple of hours north of me, but uh, yeah, that's right. It's one of those things, and it happens with any breed. You get two people with um, who don't want to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. it'll take a while before one of them decides to blink, I think, he, and that's what happened this time. Was he as good a sheep as they say he was? Oh, he's a good sheep. Um, we'll wait and see if he's worth 200 grand. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, let's see. He's gone. We'll see. We'll see what happens, what comes out. He's gone to a good home, of course. And I said earlier on, and we're talking about Tom Bailey. We've got Charlie Bowden now in the business, and he's in quite a few number of breeds. And uh, Charlie comes out with his checkbook. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. He's, fe- yeah, he's yeah, featured. In, good... He's featured in a few of our podcasts here. He takes a takes a wee, ah, right. wee bit yeah. of stop in, doesn't he? Yeah. No, really good stockman <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. Got a good team there. Uh, and uh, it was an extraordinary sale, though, this year, wasn't it? The, the premier sale, five lambs made over 40,000. Uh, the job's getting a bit hot out there now, Mike, isn't it? Well, I think it's probably that you had a number of people who were getting a bit desperate to look for a tub. And uh, and that was that's the outcome of it more than anything else. One of the... I always try and buy something most years because uh, you don't want to necessarily be... Get, wanted to be desperate in getting a ram because mm-hmm. that, that's why you end up having to spend a lot of money like that. And maybe a bit of the COVID last yeah. year might have, might have just knocked on to this year, but that is a, it well, was a bit, that's, yeah. an exceptional average, wasn't it? I mean, it was a top average. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it was good. And and it is nice to think that the rams were worth that. You know, they were good. It was a good show of sheep. Mm-hmm. Good. And we mentioned just now Malcolm Stewart. I, I wish Malcolm well. And, and um, yes, he had his sale uh, early this year and uh, quite a few smart men, I think, looking to get back into the breed, weren't they, for the right kind of sheep. There were you know, guys looking for those uh, those good commercial type of sheep that uh, may be going to breed the, 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 the tufts that you're talking about, uh, Mike, that are putting them onto Cross the News. Oh, yeah. Malcolm had a good go. And I know several people who were you know pedigree breeders went up there to buy they might not necessarily be looking for that, but they can see the, the benefits of buying that type of, of Suffolk and, you know, just having them as their own separate flock or, or whether they bring them into the main flock or not, I don't know. Mm. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people doing that because going up there and buying two or three just to see how they go. A friend of mine went up there to buy some with a fairly hefty checkbook too and came home with the trailer empty. So that sort of says a, a bit about it. I, uh, I, yeah, I won't mention yeah. names. And, and and another name, of course, that's at the fore in amongst the breeding world at the moment are the Alfords down in, in there in Devon. And uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the Alfords uh, getting in, having a dabble there, bought a female recently for 19,000, uh, was it, Mike? That puts a bit of writing on the wall, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. I think they bought two or three ewes, um, and it's the the flocks in the name of Charlotte. She's just got a new a new flock coming in. She just got married, so that's them them starting out with a new venture. And, and yeah, exactly. And we wish them, that's it. Wish them the best of luck as well, uh, Mike. I've had quite a bit of your time here. What um, is there anybody else we've missed that we think we probably should have just just? I'm back, I'm sure we've missed something because I've you know that you go back back to the eighties and there would have been a large number of flocks. There, you know, you could mention any of them. Um, 
Well, Mike, thanks very much. It's glad to see that you're still involved in the breed and, as you said, in your 70th year there and uh, wish you every success and um, really appreciate your time there sharing your, your history of the Great Suffolk breed uh, with me and our listeners. No, that's fine, Andy. Glad to, glad to have done it with you. All the best. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Top Lines and Tales. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbro, of course, who are manufacturers and suppliers of quality livestock nutrition and nutritional advice. And uh, please look them up on uh, their website or find them on Facebook. And talking of Facebook, we do have a Facebook Top Lines and Tales page. Uh, Please pay it a visit and uh, you'll find lots of photographs that will back up this episode and many other episodes besides.